from Santa Clara, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's The Cube, covering Altitude 2020. Brought to you by Aviatrix. Okay, welcome back to Altitude 2020. For the folks on the live stream, I'm John Furrier, Steve Mullaney with CEO of Aviatrix. For our first of two customer panels on cloud, with cloud network architects, we've got Bobby Willoughby with Agon, Luis Castillo, National Instruments, and David Shidnick with Fact Set. Guys, welcome to the stage for this digital event. Come on up. Hey, good to see you. Thank you. No, no, no. Okay, okay, customer panel, this is my favorite part. We get to hear the real scoop. We get the gardener giving us the industry overview. Certainly multi cloud is very relevant and cloud native networking is the hot trend with the live stream out there and the digital events. So guys, let's get into it. The journey is, uh, you guys are pioneering this journey of, of multi-cloud and cloud native networking, and there's soon going to be a lot more coming. So we want to get into the journey. What's it been like? Is it real? You got a lot of scar tissue? Uh, what are some of the learnings? Yeah, absolutely. So multi-cloud is, uh, whether or not we, we accept it as network engineers is a, is a reality. Um, like Steve said, about two years ago, companies really decided to, to just to just bite the bullet and 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 move there, um, whether or not whether or not we we accept that fact, we need to now create a, a consistent architecture across across multiple clouds, and that that is challenging um, without orchestration layers as you start managing different different tool sets and different languages across different clouds. So that's it's it's really important to to start thinking about that. Guys, um, on the other panelists here, there's different phases in, of this journey. Some come at it from a networking perspective, some come at it from a problem troubleshooting. What, what's your experiences? Yeah, so uh, from a networking perspective, it's been incredibly exciting. It's kind of a once in a generational uh, opportunity to look at how you're building out your network. You can start to uh, embrace things like infrastructure as code that maybe your peers on the systems teams have been doing for years, but it just never really worked on-prem. So it's really, uh, it's really exciting to look at uh, all the opportunities that we have and then all the uh, interesting challenges that come up that you, uh, you, that you get to tackle. And in fact said, you guys are mostly AWS, right? In yep, at, right now, though, we're, we are looking at multiple clouds. We have production workloads running in, in multiple clouds today, uh, but a lot of the uh, initial work has, has been uh, with Amazon. And you've seen it from a networking perspective, that's where you guys are coming at it from? Yep, yeah. Awesome. Bobby, what's your... Yeah, we evolved more from a customer requirement perspective. Started out primarily as AWS, but as the customer needed more uh, uh, resources from Azure, like HPC, uh, you know, Azure AD, things like that, and even recently Google, Google Analytics, uh, our journey has evolved into more of a multi-cloud environment. Steve, <coughs> weigh in on the architecture, because this is going to be a big conversation here. I wanted you to lead this section. Yeah, so I mean, I think you guys agree the journey, you know, it seems like the journey started a couple of years ago, got real serious. Um, the need for multi-cloud, whether you're there today, of course, it's going to be there in the future. Um, so that's really important. I think the next thing is just architecture. I'd love to hear what you, you know, uh, had some comments about architecture matters. It all starts, I mean, every enterprise I talk to, maybe talk about architecture and the importance of architecture, maybe, Bobby. Yeah, so from an architecture perspective, we started our journey five years ago. Wow, okay. Uh, and uh, we're just now starting our fourth evolution of our network architecture. Okay. And we call it network and security, NetSec, yep. uh, versus just as network. Yep. Uh, and that uh, fourth generation architecture will be based primarily upon uh, Palo Alto Networks and Aviatrix. Right. Uh, Aviatrix doing the orchestration piece right. of it. Uh, but that journey came because of the need for simplicity, okay. the need for a multi-cloud orchestration, uh, with right. us, us having to go and do reprogramming efforts across every cloud as it comes along. Right. I guess the other question I, I, I also had around architecture is also, Luis, maybe just talk about, I know we've talked a little bit about you know, scripting, right, and, and some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so for us, we started we started creating uh, the network constructs with cloud formation, and we've we've stuck with that for for the most part. What's interesting about that is today, on premise, we have a lot of a lot of automation around around, around how we provision networks. But cloud formation has become a little bit like the new manual for us. Mm -hmm. um, so we we're now having issues with having to to automate that component and making it consistent with our on premise architecture, making it consistent with Azure architecture and Google Cloud. So. Uh, it, it's really interesting to see to see companies now bring that layer of abstraction that SD-WAN brought to the mm -hmm. to the WAN side. Now it's going up 
into into the into, into the, the cloud networking architecture. Yeah. Great. So on the fourth generation, Bobby, you mentioned you're on fourth gen architecture. What have you guys, what have you learned? Is there any lessons, scar tissue, uh, what to avoid, what worked? What was some of the, uh, the path, what was the path well, that you took? It's probably the biggest lesson there is that when you think you finally figured it out, you haven't, right? Amazon will change something, Azure will change something, you know, Transit Gateway is a game changer. Uh, so, uh, and listening to the business requirements is probably the biggest thing we need to do up front. Um, but, uh, I think from a simplicity perspective, uh, we, like I said, we don't want to do things four times. We want to do things one time. We want to be able to write to an API, which Aviatrix has, and have them do the orchestration for us so that we don't have to do it four times. How important is architecture in the progression? Is it you guys get thrown in the deep end to solve these problems, or are you guys zooming out and looking at it? It's a, I mean, how are you guys looking at the architecture? I mean, you can't get off the ground if you don't have the network there. So all of those, you know, we're, we've gone through similar evolutions. We're on our fourth or fifth evolution. Uh, I think about what we started off uh, with Amazon without a direct connect gateway, without a transit gateway, without um, uh, a lot of the things that are available today, kind of the 80-20 that Steve was talking about. Uh, just because it wasn't there doesn't mean we didn't need it. So we needed to figure out a way to do it. We couldn't say, oh, you need to come back to the network team in a year, and maybe Amazon will have a solution for it, right? You, we need to do it now and, uh, and evolve later and maybe optimize or change the way you're doing things in the future, but don't sit around and wait. You can't. I'd love to have you guys each individually answer this question for the live stream because it comes up a lot. A lot of cloud architects out in the community. What should they be thinking about? The folks that are coming into this proactively and or realizing that the business benefits are there. What advice would you guys give them on architecture? What should they be, they be thinking about and what are some guiding principles you could share? So I would start with uh, looking at an architecture model that, that, can, that can spread and, and give consistency to the, different, to the different cloud vendors that you will absolutely have to support. Um, cloud vendors tend to want to pull you into using their native tool set, and that's good if only it was realistic to talk about only one cloud, but because it doesn't, it's, it's, um, it's super important to talk about and have a conversation with the business and with your technology teams about a consistent model. How do I do my day one work so that I'm not you know, spending 80% of my time troubleshooting or managing my network? Because if I'm doing that, then I'm missing out on ways that I can make improvements or embrace new technologies. So it's really important early on to figure out how do I make this as uh, low maintenance as possible so that I can focus on the things that uh, the team really should be focusing on. Bobby, your advice to the architect. I don't know what else I can add to that. Yeah, Simplicity of operations is, is key, right? All right, so the holistic view of day two operations you mentioned, let's jump in. Day one is you're your, your getting stuff set up. Day two is your life after, right? This is kind of what you're getting at, David. So what does that look like? Uh, how, what are you envisioning as you look at that 20 mile stair out post multi-cloud world? What are some of the things that you want in a day two operations? Yeah, uh, infrastructure as code is really important to us. So how do we how do we design it so that we can fit uh, start making network changes uh, and fitting them into like a release pipeline and start looking at it like that rather than somebody logging into a router CLI and troubleshooting things in, a, in an ad hoc nature. Um, so moving more towards a DevOps model. You guys, anything to add on that day two? Yeah, I would I would love to add something. So in terms of day two operations, you can. Um, you can either sort of ignore the day two operations for a little while where you get, well, well you get your, your feet wet, um, or you can start approaching it from the beginning. The fact is that the, the, the cloud native tools don't have a lot of maturity in that space. And when you run into an issue, you're going to end up uh, having a bad day going through millions and millions of logs just to try to understand what's going on. So. Uh, that's something that, that the industry just now is beginning to, to, to realize it's, a, it's such, a, such a big gap. Yeah, I think that's key because for us, we're, we're moving to more of an event-driven operations. In the past, monitoring got the job done. It's impossible to monitor, monitor something that's not there when the event happens. Right? So the event-driven application and then detection is important. Yeah, I think uh, Gardner was talking about the cloud native wave coming into networking. That's going to be a serious thing. I want to get your guys' perspectives. I know you have <coughs> different views of how you came into the journey and how you're executing. And I always say the beauty's in the eye of the beholder and that kind of applies to how the network's laid out. So Bobby, you guys do a lot of high performance encryption both on AWS and Azure. 
that's kind of a unique thing for you. How are you seeing that impact with multi-cloud? Yeah, and that's a new requirement for us too, where we, uh, we have a requirement to encrypt. And they, if you ever get the question, should I encrypt, should I not encrypt? The answer is always yes. You should encrypt when you should, can encrypt. From our perspective, we, uh, we need to migrate a bunch of data from our data centers. We have some huge data centers. Uh, and in getting that data to the cloud is, uh, is, is, a, is a timely expense in some cases. So we have been mandated that we have to encrypt everything leaving the data center. So we're looking at using uh, the Aviatrix Insane Mode appliances to be able to encrypt you know, 10, 20 gigabits of data as it moves to the cloud itself. David, you're using Terraform, you've got FireNet, you've got a lot of complexity in your network. What do you guys look at the future for your environment? Yeah, so something exciting that we're working on now is FireNet. So for our security team, they obviously have a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge base around Palo Alto. Uh, and with our commitments to our clients, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not very easy to shift your security model to a specific cloud vendor, right? So there's a lot of SOC 2 compliance and things like that where being able to take some of what you've, you know, you've worked on for years on-prem and put it in the cloud and have the same type of assurance that things are going to work and be secure in the same way that they are on-prem uh, helps make that journey into the cloud a lot easier. And Luis, you guys got scripting, you got a lot of things going on. What's your, what's your unique uh, angle on this? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So full disclosure, I'm, I'm not, a, not, not an Aviatrix customer yet. Um. <laughs> it's okay, we want to hear the truth, so yeah, that's good. <laughs> Tell us, what are you thinking about? What's on your mind? Um, no, really, um, when, you, when you talk about um, implementing uh, a, a tool like this, it's, it's really just really important to, to, to talk about automation and focus on, on value. So uh, when you talk about things like encryption and, and things like, um, um, so yeah, encrypting tunnels and encrypting the path, and those things are, it should, it should, should be second nature, really. Uh, when, you, when you look at building those backends and managing them with your team, it becomes really painful. So uh, tools like Aviatrix that, that add a lot of automation, it's out of, out of sight, out of mind. You can focus on the value. And you don't have to focus on, on those. So things. I got to ask you guys, obviously Aviatrix is here. They're, they're a supplier to the, this sector, but you guys are customers. Everyone's pitching you stuff. People are knocking on you, buy my stuff. How do you guys have that conversation with the suppliers, like the cloud vendors and other folks? What's, the, what's it like? We're API all the way. You've got to support this. What are, some of the, what are some of your requirements? How do you talk to and evaluate people that walk in and want to uh, knock on your door and, and, and pitch you something? What's the conversation like? Um, it's, definitely, it's definitely API driven. Um, we, we definitely look at the at, that the API structure of the, that the vendors provide um, before we select anything. Um, that, that is always uh, first of mind and also what, what problem are we really trying to solve? Usually people try to sell or try to give us something that isn't really uh, valuable like implementing a, a Cisco solution on the, on the, on the cloud isn't really, doesn't really add a lot of value, that's where we go. David, what's your conversation like with, with, with suppliers? Do you have a certain new way to do things? As, as it becomes more agile, essentially networking becomes more dynamic, what are some of the conversations with the either incumbents or new new vendors that you're having? What, a, what do you require? Yeah, so ease of use is definitely uh, definitely high up there. Uh, we've had some vendors come in and say, you know, hey, you know, when you go to set this up, we're going to want to send somebody on site and they're going to sit with you for a day to configure it. And that's kind of a red flag. Well, wait a minute, you know, do we really, if, uh, if one of my uh, really talented engineers can't figure it out on his own, what, what's going on there and why is that? So, uh, you know, having, having some ease of use and the team being comfortable with it and understanding it um, is really important. Bobby, how about you? I mean, the old days was do a bake-off and you know, the winner takes all. I mean, is it like that anymore? I mean, what's evolving? You know? We did a bake-off last year for SD-WAN. So, but that's different now because now when you, when you get the product, you can, you can install the product in AWS and Azure, have it up and running in a matter of minutes. And uh, so the key is, is that it, can you be operational you know, within hours or days instead of weeks, right? But do we also have the flexibility to customize it to meet your needs? Because you don't want to be you want to be put into a box with the other customers when you have needs that sur that surpass their their needs. Yeah, I can almost see the challenge that you guys are living, where you've got the cloud immediate value, depending on how you can roll up any solutions. But then you have might have other needs, so you got to be careful not to buy into stuff that's not shipping. So you're trying to be proactive at the same time deal with what you got. I mean, how do you guys see that evolving? Because multi-cloud to me is definitely relevant, but it's not yet clear how to implement across. How do you guys look at this? Mm. Baked versus you know future solutions coming. How do you balance that? Um, so 
again, so right now we, we're, we're taking the, the, the ad hoc approach and, and experimenting with the different concepts of cloud uh, and, and really leveraging the, the native constructs of each cloud. But, but there's, a, there's a breaking point for sure. Uh, you, you, don't, you, you don't get to scale this, uh, like, like Simon said, and you have to focus on being able to deliver uh, a developer uh, their, their sandbox or their, their play area for, for, the, for the things that they're trying to build quickly. And the only way to, to do that is with, a, with, with some sort of consistent orchestration layer that allows you to so you expect a lot more stuff to be coming pretty quickly I, in this I, area. I do expect things to start to start maturing uh, quite quite quickly this year. And you guys see a similar trend, new stuff coming fast? Yeah, yeah. Our, probably the biggest challenge we've got now is uh, being able to segment within the network, uh, being able to provide segmentation between production and non-production workloads, even businesses, because we support many businesses worldwide, and and uh, isolation between those is is a, is a key criteria there. So the ability to uh, identify and quickly isolate those workloads is, is key. So the CIOs that are watching are, are saying, hey, take that hill, do multi-cloud, and then you know, the bottoms up organization, they pause, you're kind of like off a little bit. That's not how it works. I mean, what is the reality in terms of implementing you know, in as fast as possible? Because you know, the business benefits are clear, but it's not always clear on the technology how to move that fast. Yeah. What are some of the barriers? What are the blockers? What are the enablers? I think the reality is, is that you may not think you're multi-cloud, but your business is, right? So I think the, the biggest barrier there is understanding what the requirements are and how best to meet those requirements in, in a secure manner. Right? Because uh, you need to make sure that things are working from a latency perspective, that things work the way they did. And, and get out of the mind shift that, you know, if it's a tier three application in the data center, it doesn't have to be a tier three application in the cloud. Right? So lift and shift is, is not the way to go. Yeah, scale's a big part of what I see as the competitive advantage to a lot of these clouds. And you know, it used to be proprietary network stacks in the old days, and then open systems came, that was a good thing. But as clouds become bigger, there's kind of an inherent lock-in there um, with the scale. How do you guys keep the choice open? How are you guys thinking about interoperability? What are some of the, um, uh, conversations that you guys are having around those key concepts. Well, when we look at when we look at the, from from a, from a networking perspective, it it it's really key for you to just enable enable all the all the clouds to be to be able to communicate between them. Developers will will find a way to use the cloud that best suits their their business needs. Right. Um, and and like uh, like you said, it, it's whether whether you're in denial or not. Of, of the multi-cloud fact that, that your company is in already, um, that's, it, it becomes really important for you to move quickly. Yeah, and uh, a lot of it also hinges on how well is the provider uh, embracing what that specific cloud is doing. So are they, are they swimming with Amazon or Azure and just helping facilitate things? So they're doing the, you know, the heavy lifting API work for you, or are they swimming upstream and they're trying to hack it all together in a messy way, and so that helps you, you know, stay out of the lock-in because they're, you know, if they're doing, if they're using Amazon native tools to help you get where you need to be, it's not like Amazon's going to release something in the future that completely, uh, you know, makes you uh, have designed yourself into a corner. Uh, so the closer they're, the more cloud native they are, the more, uh, uh, the easier it is to, um, uh, to deploy. But you also need to be aligned in such a way that you can take advantage of those cloud native technologies. Really makes sense. TGW is a game changer in terms of cost and performance, right? So to completely ignore that would be wrong. But uh, you know, if you needed to have encryption, you know, TGW is not encrypted, so you need to have some type of a gateway to do the VPN encryption. You know, so the Aviatrix tool gives you the, the beauty of both worlds. You can use TGW for the gateway. Well, uh, real quick, on the last minute we have, I want to just get a quick feedback from you guys. I hear a lot of people say to me, "Hey, the, I, the pick the best cloud for the workload you got." then figure out multi-cloud behind the scenes. So that seems to be, do you guys agree with that? I mean, is, is it, do I go mul one cloud across the whole company or this workload works great on AWS, that workload's great on this. From a cloud standpoint, do you agree with that, that premise? And then where does multi-cloud stitch them all together? Yeah, um, from, a, from an application perspective, it, it, it can be per workload, but it can also be a, an economical decision. Uh, certain enterprise contracts will, will pull you in one direction to add value. Um, but the, the, the network problem is still the same. Yeah, it doesn't go away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, I mean, you don't want to be trying to fit a square into a round hole, right? So if it, it, if it works better on that cloud provider, then it's our job to make sure that that service is there and people can use it. 
Thoughts? Yeah, I agree. We just need to stay ahead of the game. Make sure that the, the network infrastructure is there, secure, is available, and is multi-cloud capable. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you guys are just validating that it's the networking game now. Cloud, storage, compute, check. Networking is where the action is. Awesome. Thanks for your insights, guys. Appreciate you uh, coming on the panel. Appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>